Hey everybody, good morning. Check, check, check. Wait a little bit. Let me do it again. Hello everybody, good morning. Good morning, welcome. My name is Lance Marshall. I am the Senior Associate Pastor here at the First United Methodist Church of Fort Worth. This is The Gathering. Welcome to The Gathering. Gathering is two services of worship and connection and communion right here in Wesley Hall at 9.30 and 11 o'clock. Uh, we typically have some seating issues at 9.30. Just want to let you all know there's a, this is a Methodist church, which means there are always seats on the front. Uh, I want to welcome you up to the front if you ever need a seat. We always got plenty. Uh, please help yourself to the food and drink in the back if you haven't already done so. We do drink coffee and eat food during the entire worship service. So welcome. I'm so glad you're with us. If you need to use the restroom or if kids need to stretch their legs at any point during the service, in the back of the room, you're going to find doors into the garden. You can head into the main body of the church and find anything that you are looking for there. A couple quick words of announcement before we get going. There's white on the altar today, which means today is a special day of holy celebration. Uh, today is the first Sunday in November, which we always celebrate as All Saints Day. That's a day of celebration in the life uh, across the global church. It's a day where we, we pray and we give thanks for all the people who've gone before us, people who've gone into glory, those who we have loved and lost. Uh, a saint in the United Methodist Church is anyone who lets God's transforming grace work in their lives. We are surrounded by saints. Uh, we will have a special worship service of celebration and music for them this evening. That's from 7 to 8.15 in our sanctuary. So a beautiful service of worship and music, uh, particularly for those of us who are mourning the loss of any of those who have gone before us over the last year or so. This would be an awesome opportunity for you to celebrate them and to have a special time of worship this evening. Uh, another announcement I want to make is uh, what, last week we shared some uh, a video uh, in worship gave you a little bit of information about some of the vision that the church has going forward. You, the congregation, over a year-long process of discernment and listening, articulated a vision for the church to have facilities that meet our church needs. A church is the people, and as our church continues to grow, case in point, a room that or a worship service that outgrows every single room that you put it in, uh, we have a lot of space needs. Uh, and one of the things that we've been working on diligently as a church body is putting together solutions for opportunities to connect the church allow people and ministries to interact with, in, with each other, uh, to host special events, to host worship, uh, to allow our community to continue to try new things and do new things, to reach new people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is just a 30-second teaser video. Uh, what we're actually proposing in this Next 90 Capital campaign uh, is a pretty transformative approach to our facility, something that's way too long for us to outline during just a worship service. So I want to invite everyone to a building information session that's going to take place next Sunday. Uh, that's the 11th in the sanctuary from 2 to 3 o'clock. This is an opportunity for you to gather together to see floor plans, to see much more in-depth detail, to get information on things like timelines and costs, uh, things that will help guide you as you prayerfully reflect, is this the right step for our church to take? Obviously, this is a huge step in faith. This is a huge step forward in pursuing what we believe God is calling us to do and to be in the future, and it requires the entire church listening and thinking and praying for God's discernment and guidance. So if you want a lot more information than just a 30-second teaser video can provide you, uh, I really hope that you come and join us next Sunday, the 11th, from 2 to 3 o'clock in the sanctuary. Get a chance to see the visuals, get a chance to hear the vision, get a chance to understand the transformative nature of uh, what we can possibly do here with our campus. So again, that's next Sunday in the sanctuary, 2 to 3 o'clock. We'll have some more information sessions coming up, but please make it a point to come to this one. Uh, now, every time we come together, we do two things. We pass the baskets, and uh, two things go in the baskets. The first are our attendance cards. When you sat down today, there was an attendance card for you. Whether this is your first time in the gathering, you've never been here before, or whether this is your 100th time, you've been at every single gathering since we were up in room 350 two and a half years ago, uh, I ask that you please make note of your attendance here today. There's also opportunities for you to make note on the back of the card of some other things. Things like you're interested in becoming a Christian, being baptized, volunteering in the church, connecting with things like our young uh, professionals ministry, like our Christian men's breakfast, uh, interested in volunteering in the community, giving back, interested in just having a cup of coffee with me, getting a chance to step outside of the big congregation and, and just get to know each other on a personal level. I would hope that you uh, indicate interest in any of those things as they apply to you and put them in the basket as they come around. The second thing that goes in the basket are tithes and our offerings. Uh, that is the energy. That is the support. That is what makes all the ministries of this church possible. Our church is in an incredible season of growth and change, expansion, evangelism, inviting new people to experience the good news of God 
God in Jesus Christ, and none of this is possible. All the worship, all the connection, uh, all the service, all the prayer, all of the community, all of it is possible because of you giving sacrificially so that other people may have a transformative experience in faith. So from the very bottom of my heart, thank you so, so, so much. As those baskets come around, I now want to invite you all to stand and join with me in an invocation. Standard church rules apply. I'm going to say the leader portion. We are all going to read out loud the bold and italic. God is calling you today. Help us to hear God's call in our lives. God needs your gifts and graces to help others. May we use the blessings which God has given us to benefit others. Come, let us worship and celebrate God's love for us. Let us show our faithfulness in our words and actions. Amen. Good morning. Wow, there's a lot of y'all here. The, I'm, we're so glad you're here in the gathering today. Um, I'm Savannah, and uh, I hope that uh, I've been so fortunate to be a part of this community and uh, to be working with Lance and the band that's usually up here with me and to meet all of y'all. And um, it's just amazing to see this community growing, and we're glad you're here, whether it's your first time or whether you've been here before. Um, I hope that you find it to be a place of uh, welcoming and love and um, that you feel God's love in this place and carry that outward. Um, we're going to worship together, and uh, this song is called Simple Gospel. If you've been here before, you may have heard it. If not, it's pretty easy. I'll, I'll repeat the verses, and uh, you can follow along with me. I know a friend. I want to know you, Lord. Sing that one again. I want to know you, Lord, like I know a friend. I want to know you, Lord. I'm laying down all my box you in. I'm laying down. I want to know you, Lord. I used to think that I could box you in. I'm laying down. I want to know you,
and you may be seated. Thank you, Savannah, for leading us. Thank you also to all the volunteers who set up the gathering and made it possible this morning. A number of our regular volunteers uh, weren't here today. Uh, for some reason, people who volunteer at the gather gathering and NASCAR fans seems to be a very tightly overlapping Venn diagram. <laughs> Uh, so to all of the other people who stepped up this Sunday and just said, like, I'm going to do it. I'm going to make it happen. Thank you. God bless you. I appreciate you so, so, so much. Uh, one of the things we do every time we come together as a church is to pray. Uh, we have a tradition here at the gathering, an observation here at the gathering. One of the things that we do as a community is in, in the midst of, an, uh, of a season, an epidemic of mass shootings and gun violence, one of the things we do as the gathering as a church is just make sure that we don't get so swept up and overwhelmed by this practice that we lose sight of the individuals who are lost. And so one of the things that we do uh, every time our national attention is drawn to a tragedy like this is to come together and just pray over the names and the ages of the individuals uh, who are involved. In, in the time that we've done this, that's led us all over the country and the world and observing these kind of tragedies. It's, uh, we've had unborn children. We've had people in their 90s, uh, all who are suffering under this and lost under this tragedy. Uh, last Saturday, as many of you know, someone whose uh, heart had been twisted by uh, hate, hatred and bigotry and conspiracy theories went into a house of worship uh, and, um, and killed a number of people that, as they were worshiping in the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh. And uh, of course, that's particularly close to home, just like when it happened in a, a community of worship in Central Texas. Uh, these people's understanding of God, these people's pursuit of faith is so similar to ours in so many ways. It's just an extra level of painful. And because these people we're praying to the same God that we pray to. Uh, you know, we talk about the, the Hebrew Bible a lot. I'll, I'll use the words interchangeably, the Old Testament and the Hebrew Bible. For the people, for the Jewish people, their Bible is our Old Testament. That's just what they call the Bible. And so, so much of our scriptures even are the same. Uh, and so, in observing this community of, of raising up uh, our grief and our tears and our laments to God, I feel like there's no better way for us to do that than to uh, hear together the words of shared scripture, scripture that is equally as holy in that place as it is in this place, and that's Psalm 46. So, together as a church, let us pray. The psalmist writes, God is our refuge and strength, a help always near in times of great trouble. That's why we won't be afraid when the world falls apart, when the mountains crumble into the center of the sea, when its waters roar and rage, when the mountains shake because of its surging waves. There is a river whose streams gladden God's city, the holiest dwelling of the Most High. God is in that city. It will never crumble. God will help it when morning dawns. Nations roar, kingdoms crumble. God utters his voice, the earth melts. The Lord of heavenly forces is with us. The God of Jacob is our place of safety. Come, see the Lord's deeds, what devastation he has imposed on the earth, bringing wars to an end in every corner of the world breaking the bow and shattering the spear, burning chariots with fire. That's enough. Now know that I am God. I am exalted among all nations. I am exalted throughout the world. The Lord of heavenly forces is with us. The God of Jacob is our place of safety. Almighty God, loving God, holy God, we lift up together as a community of faith the lives of those lost in the terrible tragedies at the Tree of Life Synagogue in Squirrel Hill in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. God, we commit these, the innocent dead, to your loving care and pray your blessings over them and their families in this time of grief and loss. Joyce Feinberg, 75. Richard Gottfried, 65. Rose Mallinger, 97. Jerry Rabinowitz, 66. Cecil Rosenthal, 59 and his brother David Rosenthal, 54, Bernice Simon, 84, and her husband Sylvan Simon, 86, Daniel Stein, 71, Melvin Wax, 88, and Irving Younger, 69. God, give us a well of tears so that we may sufficiently mourn all those lost in tragedy here and everywhere in your world. God, give us the strength to persevere. God, give us the strength to continue to proclaim your good news in the face of grief and loss. And in all that we do, shape us in the image of your son, Jesus. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. God, you've created everything and all things, and everything that you create, you proclaim to be good. Evidence of your goodness, even in the midst of tragedy, continues to proclaim your presence all around us. New jobs, new lives, new hopes, new opportunities. For this, O oh God, we praise you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. At the same time, O oh God, everything that you create, you make to be free. 
and over and over again that freedom is used for purposes of sin, for hatred, for racism, for greed, for violence. Remind us, O God, that when we were at our worst, you did not give up on us or turn away from us. Instead, you joined us, came alongside us in the power and presence of your Son, Jesus the Christ, not to forsake us or give up on us, but to redeem us, to reconcile us, and through his life, death, and resurrection, restore us to life eternal with you now and forever. For this, O God, we praise you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Always and everywhere, O God, we are never alone. Through the power of your Holy Spirit, you guide us, complete us, walk alongside us, illuminate the path before us, making it possible for us to experience your grace and presence. For this good news, O oh God, we praise you. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah, for Kimberly, Lord, in your mercy. Yeah, for Bill, Lord, in your mercy. Yeah, Are there any others? Lord, in your mercy. Lord, in your mercy. For all the names spoken out loud and all the names kept in the silence of our hearts, O God, hear our prayers. For all those who grieve, for all of those who mourn, for all of those who look for the strength to endure another day of pain or loss, hear our prayers. For all the people who are seeking to change their lives, to experience your forgiveness and grace, the promises and assurance of your life eternal for the first time in their lives, hear our prayers. And for each and every one of us, seeking to know your will and be your people in the world, hear our prayers. Guide us, keep us, continue to shape us in the image of your Son, Jesus the Christ. And Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Here are our prayers. Everyone, again, welcome. My name is Lance Marshall. Uh, I'm the senior associate pastor here at First United Methodist Church. This is the gathering. I want to welcome you. There are over 300 people in the room today, and uh, I want to talk to just a portion of you today. Um, the rest of you can just hang out for a little bit. Um, of the 300 of you, there are a number of you who came here today, and you come here every Sunday, and maybe you've come to some church, uh, maybe for a long, maybe every day of your life, maybe every week of your life. Uh, and when you come to church, it's a place to come and be renewed. Uh, when you come to church, it's a place to be reconnected to the Spirit of God that you know intimately and that energizes you and sustains you. And that when you come back to church on a Sunday, it's like an, ah, oh, like I am home kind of feeling. There is a huge percentage of you that when you come to this worship service or any worship service every Sunday, that is how you feel. And I am not talking to you right now. I am talking to the portion of you who this morning coming to church was not good news. I know you're out there. You don't have to raise your hand, but I know you're out there, right? I want to talk to those of you who are here to make somebody else happy this morning. Welcome. <laughs> Welcome. It is 32 minutes to brunch. You're so close. You are so close close. I want to talk to you this morning. I want to talk to the people for whom going to any church on a Sunday morning is a moment that fills them with trepidation, that fills them with concern, that fills them with the desire to do anything else at all. I am talking to you this morning. I am talking particularly to you if you have gone to some church in the past where you've gotten up and you've researched the time or you've answered the invitation and you have gone along to a worship service and you arrived and you participated in what happened there for you was not good news. I am so thankful that you are here with us today. And specifically, this is normally a time where I would say something like, you're welcome here. You are welcome in this place. But this, today I want to talk specifically to those people, and I want to tell you, you are so much more than welcome here. Saying you're welcome here means, I'm glad you're here. I hope you like everything that we like. Come. Right? You are so much more than welcome here. The gathering does more than welcome you. The gathering, hear this, for all of you who didn't want to be here, for all of you who don't desire to go to church, for all of you who are just here to make somebody else happy this morning, you are more than welcome here. The gathering was made for you. The gathering was designed for you. Every change that we make, 
right? Every response that we do, everything that we can figure out to change or make different is always done with you in mind. The reason that we have coffee and food in the back of the room and it's free is for you, right? The reason why we go through the worship service and we explain this is what's happening and this is what's happening next, it's for you. The reason why I'm wearing jeans and an untucked shirt this morning is for both of us. <laughs> it's for both of us. But I know, I know what happens when you showed up, you came to church today and you figured, I don't know, I'll wear a collared shirt and I'll tuck my shirt in and then you got out and in the parking lot was some dude in a suit and you went, no. <laughs> I'm wearing this so you can at least say, I don't know, one of the preachers looks like me. I'm dressed nicer than him, it must be okay. Right? This place, is made for you. We're going to be talking about hospitality a lot over the course of the next uh, month. Hospitality is something that's coming up in all of our lives, right? Uh, you've got Thanksgiving coming up. You've got Christmas parties. You've got all these events. Uh, hospitality and hosting is a major focus in all of our lives during this time of year. Uh, and we're going to be focusing on the concept of hospitality in our sermon series. And we're focusing specifically on the idea of radical hospitality right? Uh, what is hospitality from a church perspective? What is hospitality from a theological perspective? What is hospitality from a I love Jesus and I want to share that love with the world perspective, right? And specifically, what do the people of faith, what do the Christians have to say about hospitality that's different than the rest of the world, right? Because honestly, you guys can learn how to be a good host and how to act hospitably from the Barefoot Contessa, right? And you can do that at home with a way nicer blender than I'll ever be able to afford, then you need to know from coming here, what do we have to say about it, right? What do we have to say about hospitality? And I got to tell you over and over and over again, there is no topic of conversation that more dominates the inside language at this place, right? That more dominates the conversations between me and the other people who help make the gathering possible than the language and the pursuit and the dream and the goal of hospitality, particularly the hospitality towards the people who are walking into this place with great fear and trepidation. It's incredibly important. Uh, in fact, you may not realize this, um, but when people who are just kicking tires on the faith thing, right, when they're just exploring the idea of maybe religion or maybe faith or maybe even just church, right, when they're kicking tires on it for the very first time, study after study after study shows that these people have decided whether or not they will ever return based entirely on what happens before I ever even get up to speak. Do you realize that? When study after study after study shows, when you ask people who are just kicking the tire on, on giving church a try or giving faith a try, they have made a decision on whether or not to ever return before the preacher ever gets up to speak. It has entirely to do with how they're treated in the parking lot, right? And how they're treated when they walk in the front door, right? And how they're treated in the coffee line, right? And how they're treated when they try to find a seat and there is no seat, right? It's on you guys. So, no. <laughs> no, over and over and over again, that has more of an impact on whether people will decide to return, how they're treated, how they're acknowledged, how they're seen, how they're made to feel by the people of God, right? And whether or not they're ever even going to give it another chance. We talk constantly about hospitality inside this place, and I want to extend that conversation to all of you over the course of the next month. We're going to be exploring hospitality. We're going to be exploring what it means to take seriously the idea that our hospitality is rooted in our understanding of who Jesus is and who we are as Jesus followers. And I need to make something very clear. When I'm talking about hospitality, right, it has nothing to do with church growth and growing services right? Which is easy to conflate the thing too, right? Because the gathering does hospitality very intentionally and very well, and we're growing. But I need to tell you, it has nothing to do with that, right? All of our pursuit of hospitality, all of our desire to be hospitable, to think about these people who are encountering the good news, who are encountering the gospel, who are encountering the church, who are encountering Jesus, for maybe the first time, everything that we're doing is built in the pursuit, not of just having more people come to church, but as us articulating and expressing three things. One, who we are, right? Hopefully, when you experience this place as hospitable and loving and caring and kind, it will tell you a little bit of something about the people who are here, right? Hopefully, it'll say a second thing. It'll say a little bit more to you about who you are, right? About how you're worthy of that kind of treatment, 
about how you're worthy of that kind of love, of how you're worthy of being seen that way, of how you're worthy of being accepted no matter what brought you through the doors today. Hopefully it will lay, say a little something about you that is affirming and positive, that recognizes the God in you. And maybe, just maybe, experiencing hospitality, experiencing kindness, experiencing love, experiencing a place being made for you will tell you just a little bit about who this is. Jesus is. So that's what we're going to be talking about over the course of November. It's going to set you guys up for the best darn Thanksgiving dinner you've ever hosted. Heaven's going to come crashing down into earth. The lion's going to lay down with the lamb across your kitchen table. The cowboys are going to win. Everything's going to be great. Look, okay, we promise miracles, but not every miracle. I want to talk to you a little bit uh, about this image of Jesus that I love. It's, if you've got your Bible with you today, it's going to be in Revelation, chapter 3, Revelation. the very last, but it's the caboose of the Bible. Uh, so turn to the very back of your Bible. If you've got the red CEB Bibles uh, that were from the racks in the back, it's going to be on page 937. Uh, we're going to be reading just one verse of, of Scripture today. Normally we do uh, a lot longer Scripture reading, but we're going to be doing a little bit more focused version today because there's just so much in it to Im- unpack. So uh, if any of y'all were here at the gathering in the spring of last year, 2017, We did an entire season of teaching uh, on the book of Revelation here in the gathering. Went through seven weeks. What does does Revelation reveal, right? Revelation is an incredibly complicated book, tons of imagery, tons of information that you need to know. Uh, It's not about the USSR. It's not about ISIS. It's not about Gorbachev. But what is it about then, right? The the book of Revelation is very complicated from a genre piece. It's a letter. Uh, it's um, It's a prophecy. And it's a apocalypse, which is an imagery of, you know, you have to teach you a lot about the literature of the ancient Near East. But I want to focus on just one verse today. And in just one verse, the man who's writing down the book of Revelation for us, he, he introduces himself as John of Patmos. He's an early Christian teacher. He's an early Christian mystic and prophet. And he has this experience, right? He has this experience that he has to write down in this book. He has a revelation from Jesus Christ given to him, right? He has this vision. He has this encounter with the Christ who's already risen from the dead and ascended into heaven. He receives what he believes is this message from Christ to Christ's church, and it has so much to do to teach the people of Christ. It has so much to do to teach the people who are following Jesus in their world and in their place about what it means to be faithful, about what it means to follow him, that he shared this big message to us, right? So that's what the book of Revelation is. And in chapter 3, verse 20, where we're going to be reading, he's writing a letter to seven different churches, right? And he's writing letters to actual churches and actual places in the region that we now call Turkey. But the lessons that he's teaching them have a great deal to apply to us Christians in the center of Tarrant County in 2018 as well. So in particular, he's writing to this church in Laodicea. And one of the things that the church in Laodicea has become, he says, Jesus says to him to tell to them, see, (laughs) took seven weeks to get through it. One of the things that he said, Jesus said to him to tell to them, (laughs) it took twice. Okay, good to know. Eleven's going to get it in one. (laughs) You have to decide if you're in or out. I mean, that's... (laughs) This is what it's going to be. And if it's, you're out, we could use more chairs. So um, <laughs> we all got an extra hour of sleep. <laughs> uh, one of the things that he says, Jesus said to him to tell to them, is that they've become too lukewarm, right? They've become where their following of Jesus is just too wishy-washy to them. It's too non-urgent to them, right? It's just something extra that's been padded on to the side of their life, right? An interesting factotum about them is maybe that's the religion they've adopted. It's not something central to them, right? It's not something urgent to them. It's not something that's resulting in an on-fire life that is different than the world around them. That's the message that he's writing to them, right? What he's needing them to understand is that following Jesus and accepting Jesus and being one of his people in the world is not just something that you pay homage to for a few hours a week when you go to a special designated place. It's actually something that needs to be alive in you. It's something that needs to be present in you. It's something that needs to be active in you at all moments of your life. That's the message that he has to share. And the image that he has is one of my favorite images of Jesus in the entire Bible. It's a Jesus that's proactive. 
It's a Jesus that's searching out. It's like the Jesus who goes searching after, even though he has 99 sheep in the pen, goes after the one who is lost because that's who he is. He's proactive. That's who he is. He seeks out. That's who he is. He shows up. That's our verse today. Revelations 3, verse 20. Hear these words. At the end, I'm going to say uh, God speaks to us through the reading of Scripture, and you're going to say, thanks be to God. This is Jesus speaking in the first person to us. Look. I'm standing at the door and knocking, Jesus says. If any hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to be with them, and we'll have dinner with them, and they will have dinner with me. God speaks to us through the reading of Scripture. The people of Laodicea are behaving as if Jesus is distant, right? Right? Because they grew up in a cultural attitude where the gods were kind of distant or capricious. And they grew up with an attitude that maybe the gods or Jesus is only listening or paying attention when we call his name. Right? Maybe this God, maybe this new God present in this man Jesus is someone who's not actually interested or invested with the everyday moments of our everyday life. And we have this image, Jesus' own words speaking to us. I am am at your house. I am in your life. I am knocking on your door. Jesus is not distant. Jesus is not gone. Jesus is not somewhere else. For the people of Laodicea, he is saying to them, I am right in your midst. Let me in. To the people of the six other churches that he's writing to in the book of Revelation, he is saying to them, I am right in your midst, knocking on the door, let me in. To each and every one of you in the gathering, particularly our group of people who haven't experienced or encountered it yet, the good news is that the God who loves you. The good news is that the God who in Jesus Christ has sacrificed God's own self for your sins so that you may be reconciled, so that you may be redeemed, so that you may be seen and known and called good and loved. That God, that good God is not sitting back patiently waiting for you to figure it out. That God is seeking you in your life now and every moment. He's not passively waiting for you. He is knocking on your door, desiring to be more than just present in you when you come to worship, desiring more to be just present to you in your times of prayer when you recognize it, desiring to sit with you at your very table, the very center of your hearth and your home, to be with you now and then and every single moment, not because you deserve it, but because that is who he is. Over and over again, when people are exploring the possibility of making Jesus' story their story, are exploring the possibility of becoming Christian people, are exploring the possibility of letting the good news of Jesus Christ becoming more than something that maybe they just assent to or just a prayer that they say to their television screen, but something that actually becomes a living part at the very heart and center of their life. When people start to explore that idea, they start to think, I should do that when I've got it figured out. Can anyone relate to that? I should do that when I start feeling better about myself. I should do that when I start being faithful to my spouse. Mm. I should do that once my browser history gets sorted out. I should do that once I string more than seven days on the wagon together. One of the great tensions that people have when they believe themselves to be on the outside is to say, I should do that when I feel like I'm worthy of that love. What I need you to hear is the God present in Jesus Christ who knows you 
and who sees you and who loves you and who cares about you to the point of giving his own life so that you may be forgiven, so that you may be redeemed, so that you may have life eternal is not waiting for you to figure it out. He is knocking on the door in the midst of your mess asking to be let in to that. He's not waiting for you to start acting and living like a good Christian person before he will give you his grace. Do you understand? The God who is real in Jesus Christ is meeting you where you are at today. So how do we do that, right? How do we actually live in the midst of that? I'll be honest with you, this is something that I face as a temptation. Um, I'm falling short of my own ideals all the time. I am falling short of my own uh, desire to live this perfect and holy in every way life. Oh, I don't want to shock you guys. I know you guys were expecting like a real, you know, Fred Rogers character up here. I'm doing my best. I keep falling short. This is a transformational image in my life right? The idea that Jesus is knocking on the door, and he's not waiting for me to stop being anxious. He's not waiting for me to stop being depressed. He's not waiting for me to stop gossiping. He's not waiting for me to stop being prideful. He is knocking on the door, wants to encounter me in the midst of whatever it is is that's holding me back, and speak into that. So what I do, and I did it on the way here this morning, I want to invite you into a practice, and it's what I call uh, Jesus in the passenger seat. This is the best practice I've ever come to live into this. Uh, For any of you that have a moment in the day where you're driving by yourself, the practice that I like to imagine uh, is Jesus in the passenger seat. Um, And I I just speak to him like a normal person. I speak to him like a normal person, and I speak to him, and I just describe to him everything that's going wrong. Right? I describe to him everything that's going wrong in my professional life. I describe to him everything that's going wrong in my life, in my marriage. I described to him everything that's going wrong uh, in my trying to parent. I described to him everything that's going wrong in my preaching. I described to him everything that's going wrong in my community. I described to him everything that's going wrong in my nation. I described to him everything that's going wrong in my intimate friendships. I described to him everything that's going wrong in the lives of the people that I care about the most. I imagine him in the passenger seat, and I just tell him everything that is going wrong, everything that is pulling me down, everything that is making me just want to give up. And I ask him, do you have anything to say to that? And he always does. Jesus meets us where we're actually at. Not our cleaned up version, not our pretty version, not us at our best, not us all cleaned and washed and wonderful and presentable. Jesus meets us where we're actually at. And real hospitality, real radical hospitality, rooted in Christ, is meeting people where they're actually at. As a church, right? In the gathering, every single time you come to these doors, we're interested in not the cleaned up you, not the perfect you, not you with the shiny face on, not you with the, how are you doing? Too blessed to be stressed, too anointed to be disappointed. (laughs) I'm actually the only one who says that. (laughs) We're not interested in that. And that's fine. You can do it if you want. We'll wait for you. You can be that way if you want. We'll wait for you right? We're interested in the real you. We're interested in the you that's actually struggling. We're interested in you that's actually hurting. We're interested in you that actually just barely crawled through the doors this morning. We're interested in the you that's just here to make somebody else happy. We are here for you. We're here for everybody else in that way too. That's what radical hospitality is all about. We're here to welcome you, not just when you're on your best behavior. And we do that too in the rest of our lives. So let me ask you, you who are opening your homes, you that are bringing people over, you that are calling family together, are you asking the people to show up different than they actually are? Are you asking people to show up on their best behavior? Are you asking people to show up cleaned up? Are you asking people to show up with a false face on? Radical hospitality is being willing to welcome somebody as they really and truly are. If anyone here uh, wants to make uh, my wife happy, I would appreciate your help. Uh, No. (laughs) The thing that you can do to make my wife happy that is just like this little trick anyone can learn is invite her over to the house without you picking up first. 
right? If we ever go somewhere or my wife ever goes somewhere, she never fails to mention it. If she goes over to someone's house and there's like kids' toys on the floor, or if she goes over to someone's house and there's dirty dishes in the sink, or if she goes over to someone's house and she uses the restroom and there's like a Scooby-Doo towel on the floor and a bunch of toothpaste on the sink, maybe this is just us and our friends. If we ever go over and we experience that, Elizabeth knew that they had two choices. They had two choices. Because obviously they didn't want their house to look like that when company was coming over. They had two choices. Choice one was to say, you know what? It's not a good time. Don't come over. Right? Wasn't able to get it clean. Wasn't able to get it figured out. I'm too embarrassed for you to see me like this. You know what? It's not a good time. Let's reschedule. That was option one. And the second option to say, it's a mess. It's real life over here. It's not my pretty face. I still want to see you. It's real over here. There is toothpaste on the countertop. There is, the cat did something somewhere and we can't find it. (laughs) And in the midst of all of that, I still want to see you. I still want to see you. This is a place that's all about radical hospitality, particularly for those of you who are in need of a little bit of it who need to know that this is someplace safe where they can go, they can be their real selves, they can drag themselves into the door. This place, rooted in Christ, is here for you. May we, the people of God, may we, the Christians, may we, rooted in Christ, be that good news for others everywhere else we go. Please pray with me. Great and loving God, we have this image of you. We have this image of your son, Jesus. We have this image of him knocking on the door, and God, we are not ready. We are not picked up. We are not presentable. No matter what kind of face we put on for the world around us, God, we are in need of a little grace. Remind us, O God, that you who loves us, you who redeems us, you who reconciles us, is not waiting for us to get it all together before showing up and sharing your grace with us. May we do the same for others so that when anybody encounters us, they encounter just a reflection, just a fraction, just a glimmer of your endless love for them. And God, in all that we do, let us share your love, let us share your peace, let us share your good news with the people around us. Enable us to do that as we pray the words that your son Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As I invite our communion stewards to come forward and assist with the serving of communion today, just a reminder that we experience the sacrament of Holy Communion every single Sunday. If this is your first time here, we do it every time we come together. We do it because this is an opportunity to taste, touch, feel, and know the presence of God alive and with us now and every day. And it's rooted in Jesus' actions. It's rooted in Jesus' own works and words to us. From the day that he was to give himself up for us, Jesus had dinner with his best friends, his followers, his disciples. He took an ordinary loaf of bread and knowing what they were gonna face, knowing what we were gonna face, He took the bread, he gave thanks over it, he broke it, and he said, take all of you and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And so we do it in remembrance of him, particularly when we need an extra reminder of his unconditional love for us. After the meal was over, he took an ordinary chalice of wine, gave thanks over it, blessed it and passed it, and said, take all of you and drink. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so we do it often in remembrance of whatever gulf we believe separates us from God, whatever distance we believe makes it hard for us to experience or to know or to be changed by God's love that that very act of sacrifice on the cross undid with that distance now and forever. So every week we come forward to taste, touch, feel, and know that whatever we're facing, whatever we're going through, whatever lies we've come to believe about ourselves, that we are known and loved, saved and redeemed 
by our Lord Jesus Christ. We always come down the center aisle with our hands held open and up. A piece of bread is then torn off the loaf uh, and placed in your hands. You then dip it in the cup, eat it, and turn down the outside aisle for a time of silent prayer or for singing along with Savannah. We always have non-alcoholic grape juice so that no one ever has to choose between sobriety and the sacrament. We also have a gluten-free station off to the very side for anyone with a sensitivity to wheat. This is not the First United Methodist Church's table. This is not the gathering's table. This is Christ's table. And like Christ's unconditional love, like Christ knocking on the door, it is for all people, all ages, all backgrounds. It is for you today. The table is set. The meal is ready. Come forward. Be fed. seasons change the whole world turns the other way I will not take my love away I will not take my love away When praises cease and seasons change, the whole world turns the other way. I will not take my love away. Striving leads you far from home. There's no yield for what you've sown. I will not leave you all alone. I will not. When striving leads you far from home, there's no yield for what you sow. I will not leave you all alone.
always look to me and I will give you what you need I will not take my love away As we come to the end of our time of worship today, just a reminder, if, if y'all want uh, a vision of how we might possibly have a space where everyone could have a seat when they come to the 930 gathering, we'd love to have you uh, come to the presentation next uh, Sunday on the 11th from 2 o'clock to 3 o'clock in the sanctuary. Um, also want to let you know that uh, all this is made possible by the, the volunteers and the people who share their gift for hospitality and love and, and just extending God's grace to those who visit. If you're one of the people who wants to make the jump from going to church, to really belonging at church, to having a church home, the best way to do so is to volunteer and to give back. And for those of you who are particularly interested in responding to this call to hospitality, uh, to be one of the people that helps the church be the church, particularly for people who are coming for the first time next Sunday and the following Sunday, the 11th and the 18th, after the gathering services, Lisa and Donna, who are like our hospitality ninjas here at the gathering, uh, are going to be welcoming people and just kind of showing them the ropes and what it is to be involved. So if you're one of the people who'd love to have that uh, way of being engaged, we'd love to just share with you how to do it. That'll be next Sunday and the following Sunday uh, after the uh, gathering worship services. If you would, please help look around you, pick up any uh, cups, napkins, things along those lines, pins and attendance cards and empty seats we can leave for the next service, any other pieces of trash, if you could pick them up and take them to the rear of the room, help us throw it away. That would help us get ready for the next service, which is going to start in just 40 minutes. Now, would you please bow your heads and receive this benediction? May the Lord bless you and keep you. May God's face raise to shine upon you. And may you, the people of God, share the warmth and the presence of God's love with everyone you meet. Amen. Go in peace.